is so funny to tell you the full story of what happened. But Jesus is so good. Let me, what he didn't tell you is how he challenged me in a godly way, which is what you want in a senior leader. He said, you have to come see what God is doing at Mosaic. And then he left it at that. Now, Mark is a talker. And for him to stop and say, come see what God is doing was a big deal. So we came and saw and just could not get over the fact that we were falling in love with you, with Mosaic, which is incredible. <clears throat> and it's so awesome to be here. So I just want to, first of all, thank Jesus for bringing us here. And, um, and of course, the leaders, uh, Pastor Mark, Pastor Harry, Pastor Mike, for the opportunity that I get to teach. Um, as, we, uh, as we come to this place, we're just so humbled. My wife and I are so humbled. We spent eight years in Miami, Florida, doing ministry, serving churches, and uh, had a great time there. And the Lord called us away from that, and we're so blessed. A lot of people look at me and they say, you came from Miami? Why? And I go, because Mosaic. It's because of Mosaic, what God is doing here. So um, what I want to do is just give glory to God in this moment. Thank you so much for having us, and thank you for just adopting us into your family and I just want to visit with you for a moment because the the uh, transition to Little Rock has been very interesting coming from Miami uh, I am originally from Venezuela but like I said eight years in South Florida and now we come here and we've uh, begun to adapt to the city and to this beautiful people uh, there have been many things that have happened that have been just really cool and incredible of how people have been welcoming us but one of them happened at the Waffle House by our new location the other day. I've been telling the staff this, and as many people as I meet, I just have to tell this story. Um, I was uh, checking out. I was paying for my meal, and I had my son uh, with me. Now, if you haven't, if, if you want to know about my son, you need to see my wife. So I want to introduce you to Aaron Diaz. Please stand up, Aaron, so that they can see you. This is my lovely wife. Now, because of my wife. My son came out, let's call it white chocolate. He's beautiful. We waited for him for 10 years. We're in the middle of a process of adoption when she got pregnant and it's, he's our miracle baby. And he looks like the both of us. He has my dimples, but like I said, he's white. And so he's a great combination. I had him right here on my hip and I was paying. And the lady looked at me and then she looked at him and stared. I am the dad, don't worry, I'm not the manny. <laughs> she said, is he your son? And I said, yes. She said, is he half Hispanic? And I said, yes, he is half Hispanic, half American. And she said, wow, I have never seen a white Mexican before. Sure, sure, he is a white Mexican. <laughs> if that works for you, that's great. So, but it's just, Little Rock has been incredibly welcoming like that. Just, just amazing. So we love it here. And today I have a beautiful task, which is to talk about God's perfect way. Everybody say God's perfect way. And just so that we can get a little loosened up, to the, to, to, turn to the person to your, uh, or the person that's closest to you and tell them you look beautiful this rainy morning. Turn to the person you just ignored and tell them, I love you too, don't worry. And turn to the person behind you, I'm expecting lunch after this. Because we're Christian. We go to lunch together after church at the Waffle House. <laughs> We're going to talk about God's perfect way, but I have a subtitle for this uh, talk, for this teaching, and it's called Even If. If you're on social media, once you understand this message, you are welcome to hashtag it, even if. If you don't know what hashtag means, just see me after the service, and I'll teach you a thing or two about social media. Even if, everybody say out loud, even if. And we're going to uh, go to the book of Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. And it says, 
You're going to see it on the screen. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken with Quirinius, when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, for giving us life. Thank you that you overcame. Thank you that you do great things in the life of your people, for you, for your name, for your glory. Thank you that you not only save us, but you give us a mission on this earth. And that as we live out that mission, we're able to see the fulfillment of your plans in our lives. Father, I pray that today we're able to focus on the message of your son, Jesus, not on this messenger. Because I am imperfect, but you are a perfect king in the middle of this Christmas season and in our lives. And I pray these things your holy and powerful name, Jesus, son of God. Amen. Traveling with a pregnant woman is risky business. It's messy. Have you ever traveled with a pregnant woman? Yeah, some of you have traveled when you were pregnant. I traveled with my pregnant wife when she was about eight months. And let me tell you, it was risky, messy business. We were visiting her folks up north. And there was, there was whining, there was weeping, there was stopping in, at every gas station to go to the bathroom. Uh, there was complaining, and then there was whatever she would do. It, there was... I have orders not to put my wife out there when I'm preaching. But it is d difficult, messy business because you don't know if the baby's going to come while you're traveling, especially if they're towards the last few weeks. Just ask my mom, who is here this morning, and she was born in an elevator. This is true. Everybody, look at my mom right there. Uh, just welcome her, and thank God for that elevator. The Bible says, honor your, your father and your mother, so I honor my mother in this moment because of that, and I thank the Lord that that elevator didn't get stuck. Because she got cleaned after. You just never know what's going to happen when you're traveling with a pregnant woman. Because it's messy. It's risky. It's interesting. It's a journey. And in this passage, we find a Joseph who is traveling with a pregnant woman. And he is going towards God's will. And I'm not even sure he knows that all of this is planned by God. I know that he has a clue. But all these factors in the Roman Empire are moving so that he can get to that point. So that he can say, this is God's perfect way, even if I'm traveling with a pregnant woman. Even if it's messy. If, even if... It's risky. Everybody say out loud again, even if. See, the Roman Empire was an, a kingdom full of many saviors. This emperor at the time wanted to be portrayed as a savior. And the reason that a census was put out was not only to count people, but also to count what their taxes were going to be. Because his crown needed to grow. Because his finances needed to continue growing. And all the governors of these little provinces throughout the Roman Empire were also considered many saviors. And they also wanted a cut of that. And this is why in uh, Roman times they would do census is to know how much money they were going to get. Now, there's discussion whether this is something that happened throughout the whole empire or just in the province of Judea. We're going to trust what the Bible says and understand that it happened throughout the whole kingdom and it meant that inconvenience was going to be reigning in the life of people. It meant that inconvenience was going to come to the life of Joseph and Mary, whose pregnancy was already riddled with inconveniences. It was a journey that was riddled with obstacles, starting with the fact that she got knocked up without being married. It started with the fact that she had been a virgin and that she was pregnant out of the Holy Spirit. Who would believe that? Well, her husband, Joseph. Because he knew what God was doing. He knew that God was up to something and that uh, he, they needed to be obedient to the end. I don't know if he knew 100% of what was going on. But I think because Jesus came in that environment, in that situation, he knew this was God's perfect way. Now, I want to clarify something before we dive into the text. 
And I'm not going to go too deep, but I think we're going to draw a few principles that are going to encourage us today and hopefully challenge us. But what I want us to understand is what is God's perfect way? See, I think God's perfect way, if you do a study in the whole Bible, you're going to find that it's either um, his word, his will, or his son. God's perfect way throughout the Bible is is making reference to either the word of God, the Bible, his plans, or his will, or his son. And I kind of drew a working definition of God's perfect way so that we can all have this. And I'm going to put it on the screen for us. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. And it's this. God's perfect way is a road where my obedience to his precepts and surrender to his plans intercept in a journey that results in the fulfillment of God's will for my life and honors Jesus' name above mine. It is a road, a journey where my obedience to his precepts, God's perfect way, always aligns with his perfect word. This is how you know whether you're in God's perfect will is if you are being obedient to his word and following him and surrender to his plans. And the fact that God is sovereign, God has a plan, not just for the whole world, but also for your life. That in obedience, we surrender to him. These two things intercept in a a journey that is going to result to the fulfillment of that plan that God has for me. But it honors Jesus' name above mine. If it honors my name above Jesus, we are outside of God's perfect way and will. But if it honors Jesus' name above mine, then it means that we're on the right track. And sometimes we may or may not even know this, but God, when he, when he honors and glorifies himself in us, then not only are we affected, but the whole world around us is affected in a way that hearts are changed forever. And eternities are changed. And lives have a brand new beginning. So with that, I wanted to basically begin by understanding what that is. Let's make, uh, in reference to this, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 31, where it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. This is an example of the Bible pointing at the fact that God's way is perfect. Everybody say out loud again, God's way is perfect. And this is what the Bible all throughout tells us. And now I want to dive into Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 4, and understand just a few lessons that we can get about God's perfect way in our lives. Let's read in verse 4. Because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. Here's a The first thing that I want us to understand from this is that God's ways are perfect even if there's a journey. Everybody say, even if. God's ways are perfect even if there's a a journey. Notice how it says that he had to go to Bethlehem. A journey was necessary for him to go where God wanted him to go. Now, if you were here last week, you got a summary of the journey that Israel took all the way from creation to the moment of this birth. Pastor Mark did a great job in giving us that history. But then when you're just, you're just a few days away from this happening, God is saying, now you have to travel about 80, 90 miles somewhere else so that you can give birth to my gift to humanity. There was a journey involved, and Joseph still had to go through this journey. This is the equivalent of saying, if you're a pregnant woman here in Little Rock today, you need to go to Diaz, Arkansas, which is about 100. Oh, you guys didn't know there was a Diaz, Arkansas? About 100 miles from here, I have my own town. (laughs) Population, 200 rednecks. It's towards the the northwest, past Jacksonville. You go to Diaz, Arkansas. I've never been there, but now it's in my bucket list. I'm going to buy a house there in Diaz, Arkansas. Imagine if... You're pregnant, and I know some of you are pregnant here, ladies, and somebody were to tell you, God were to tell you, okay, you're going to go to Diaz, Arkansas, about 90 to 100 miles away from here. You're going to do this by foot or by donkey, and by donkey I don't mean on top of your husband. I mean you're going to get on a, 
and you're going to go all the way to Diaz Arcas, and then you're going to get there, and there's not going to be room in the hotels of Diaz Arcas. The Ramada at the Diaz Arkansas town is going to be closed, and you're going to have to go into a stable. There's a journey that was difficult, a process that was probably painful. It's something that was incredible and very hard to believe. Yet these two young people take on this journey, and they follow the process. And this is a word that when we start to understand God's perfect way in our lives, we fear, which is the word process. We don't want to go through process. We're usually praying to God saying, Lord, bring me my, the perfect woman tomorrow. I'll be waiting for her at the gym. Or uh, bring me that perfect man this week. I know I am ready. And God is saying, uh-uh, there is process. Mosaic Church asking, Lord, give us the right location. And God is saying, not yet, not yet, not yet. See, I have, a, I have the blessing of coming into Mosaic at a really interesting time because I am joining you guys here in the Walmart, and all of us together are going to be known as the Walmart crowd once we cross the street. And you're all going to look at each other, and you're going to share scars. You're going to share stories. You're going to share memories. And I'm going to be there saying, uh-huh, I know. I was there for the last three weeks. <laughs> but that, yeah. <coughs> Some of you got history, yeah. But there's a process. And there was a process for a mosaic. And God is doing something so incredibly, incredible here that... Uh, it's such an honor to just be in, in your midst, even though you have gone through the process. And sometimes we focus so much on the inconvenience of the process that we just don't want to go forward. And we drop out. Maybe there's process that your heart has to go through in order for God to bless you in the way you want to be blessed. Are you willing to go through the process? Are you willing to go through the journey? Or maybe there's relationships in your life that need process. Are you willing to put in the work? And all of this is not because God cannot do it overnight. It's because he's going to get the glory if you surrender to him as he does this over time. It's because he wants to glorify himself and you and who you are right now, who you will be later for his glory, even if it's painful. In this case, there was a purpose to the process. And this purpose is, we can see it in, the, in, in Micah, the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. Check this out. This is where we see the purpose to the process. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of, Ju of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from the distant past. This is the prophecy that God gives Israel that everybody ignored that the Savior was going to be born in the town of Bethlehem. A small little town that everybody was ignoring at the time. And yet God sets the whole world in motion. And everybody was going to be inconvenienced so that these two teenagers would make the trek for 90 to 100 miles all the way to Bethlehem so that Jesus could be born there. We hate process, yet we have to go through it. We do it with our health. How many of you want to lose weight in 2016? That, that's me. I want to lose weight in 2016. Okay, so a few years ago, that was, that was my, that, well, really, that's been my life goal every year since like <laughs> 2000. <laughs> every year. And one year, I decided I'm not going to go through the process. I am going to buy a little salt shaker called Sensa. I don't know if you ever saw that on TV. And you, you watched it in the middle of the night, yeah, because it came on, on TV and you bought it as seen on TV. Well, Sensa, for those of you who were blessed to not know what it is, it was supposed to be a salt shaker with a powder that if you were to put on your food, it would take your hunger away. Now, that is um, stupid. <laughs> but hey. So I bought stupid. I signed up, membership and all, and I thought, no gym, just with my little salt shaker, and wouldn't you know that nothing was happening. Of course, I was seeing in the mirror, uh, you know, just, just an image that wasn't there. I'm going, wow, this is really working. Meanwhile, everybody around me was going, I don't know that it's working. 
you might want to get to the gym. Well, about six months later, they show on TV that Sensa had been sued because the powder had nothing. Because it wasn't real. It was just sugar that I was putting. No, no, this is why I was, you know, going the opposite direction than how I wanted to go. Because I wasn't willing to go through the process. Because you know what the process is to get healthy? is to experience a certain level of pain. Did you know this? When you go to the gym and you are working out, and by the way, we're going to be right next to 10 Fitness, so after a year next to 10 Fitness, we all better look great. But when you're working out, your muscles hurt because they are breaking. They're creating crevices. And that pain tells you that something is broken, but then what happens? The muscle uh, sort of recycles and rejuvenates itself, and it fills that crevice with more muscle, and that's how you grow muscle. But first, you have to go through a process that leads you purposefully through pain. And often, we run away from purpose because we know that it's going to bring the pain of the waiting, the pain of the exercise, the pain of the unknown, the pain of whatever. We run away from it. Yet, we see in Joseph and Mary being obedient to the calling of God that the journey had to be undertaken the whole way. That the process needed to be undertaken the whole way. And all of this happened. You're, you're maybe thinking, why did this happen? Why couldn't God have just brought his son without all that process and put him in a, in a throne in the middle of the Roman Empire? And I think the reason is because God wanted an extraordinary Savior to be born into ordinary circumstances so he could be the Savior of ordinary people like you and me. Amen? An extraordinary Savior that nobody was expecting at the moment. Only people who were not even believers. And they caught a glimpse of a light. And, to, and this star took them there to see the fulfillment of the prophecy of God, the Messiah being born in these circumstances. Let's keep reading verse 5 um, in Luke chapter 2. He took with him Mary, his fiance, who was now obviously pregnant. This is what I want us to understand from this verse, is that God's ways are perfect, even if, I've been using this word all throughout on purpose, they're inconvenient. God's ways are perfect, even if they're inconvenient. In fact, I am willing to say that inconvenience is the right environment for the work of God. If your life is filled with inconvenience, God can work in that. If your life is far from perfect, God can work in that. If your life is full of obstacles, God can say that those are not obstacles to me, and you're about to see what I'm about to do. Even if life is full of inconveniences, God's way is perfect See, a, a, a few years ago, um, somebody came up with a movie called The Nativity Story, and, it, and they portray these two teenagers who were traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem, but they took a little bit of a poetic license. The Bible wrote, doesn't really say why, what kind of geographical obstacles they went through in this journey, but they, they portrayed mountains and deserts and even a river where Joseph over here, you can see him on the screens if you're here, had to save a drowning Mary in order to get her all the way to the end of the journey. Even in the, in, the, in the moment of inconvenience, they got to where they needed to go. We never think of these moments. We never think of the fact that Joseph and Mary were two teenagers who were traveling in artist terrain, basically in the wilderness. Maybe they were traveling with a lot of people, maybe they weren't, but they had to face the obstacles that this land offered. At some point, I would have just given up. At some point, I would have said, there's a, there's a Ramada right there. We're going to stay there. We're not going to pay our taxes, and you're going to give birth right here because I don't want to go all the way. See, in the middle of this inconvenience, a sacrifice from their own part had to be made. Not the full-on sacrifice that Jesus was about to make because that is the the one sacrifice that forgives our sins and that takes care of our eternity. But from our part, we also have to offer to God a sacrifice that says, I am willing, yes, to obey you even if there's an inconvenience, even if there are obstacles, even if things look messy, even if they look imperfect because you are a perfect king. 
I am willing to do so. I am willing to follow it. Think of Hebrews chapter 11. That it begins by saying, faith is the uncertainty of what is not seen. And if you read Hebrews chapter 11, you can read it this week at home. You see a whole list of people whose lives were filled with inconvenience. Moses, Abraham, Jacob, all these men and women who followed a God in his calling and his commandment through the road of inconvenience so that we could see that faith is, in fact, the certainty of what is not seen. People who had to go to places that they didn't know, keeping the distances. Our story of how we got to Mosaic is similar to Abraham's story. If you know who Abraham was, you, you know that God called this man who was wealthy, and he was uh, living in the town of in the city of Ur, where today is uh, modern-day Iraq. He was wealthy, and God showed up to him and said, you have to go to the land that I will show you. He didn't give him a map. He didn't give him an iPad with Apple Maps. He would have gotten lost because Apple Maps don't work. But... He said, get up and go. Have you ever left a life not knowing where the next stage is going to be? About a year ago, my wife and I found ourselves in this situation. We were leading a beautiful uh, church filled with young adults in South Florida in the city of Hialeah. I was one of the oldest ones in this church, believe it or not. It was, it was a great church. We were very comfortable. We had great friends there. We went through some great stages of ministry. This wasn't an exit out of malcontent or discontent. This wasn't an exit out of pain. This wasn't an exit uh, out of relational woes. At one point, we felt God saying, get up and go to the land that I will show you. And we, we doubted it. And we ran it by people in our lives who are godly. And we, sa- we said, can you... Can you confirm this in our lives? And they said, yes. After a lot of prayer, yes. God is leading you somewhere. We don't know where. And so we just basically after a certain amount of time, we stood up in front of our church and said, the Lord is calling us somewhere else. We don't know where, but we have to go. This was in the middle of January of this year. And since January up until the middle of October, we didn't really know where God was going to lead us until he showed us mosaic. And once we got to Mosaic, we we took a deep breath and realized, first of all, God took care of us the whole way. And secondly, how crazy to just leave a great, almost perfect situation in order to go where God is calling you to go. This is why I'm saying I'm keeping the distances with Abraham because I'm I'm not half the man that he was. But in this one particular moment, we understood that God was calling us away onto something else. He took care of us every single step of the way, you guys. And I'm telling you this as a tangent, but trust in God no matter what. Because from the moment that we left that church to the moment that we got to this church, he took care of us every single step of the way. And I have a little boy. He is almost two years old, and we lacked nothing, praise the Lord. He led us all the way, and we lacked nothing. See, the thing with inconvenience is that it may look imperfect in our eyes, but it may look like the perfect setting in God's eyes. And maybe if you're thinking of your life as filled with inconvenience, with imperfection, know that you have a perfect king who came into this world to save you, to use you, and to give you a mission, to give you a future and a hope that in the middle of that inconvenience, God can work. And so my question to you is, can you trust him in the middle of the inconvenience? Can you trust him in the middle of the mess? Can you trust him in the middle of imperfection? We'll keep reading in verse 6 and 7 right there in Luke 2. It says that while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to this first child, a son, and she wrapped him in snugly strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. And here's the last principle I want us to get from this. is that God's ways are perfect even if... There's a rapper. Not a rapper like my brother Kai. He is a great rapper. Even if there's a covering. Remember when you were kids 
And if you experienced Christmas with presents, I realize a lot of us maybe have not, but some of us experience receiving gifts on Christmas Day. Remember when you were a little kid that you started focusing a lot more on the box, on the covering, on the wrapper than the actual gift? My son is in that stage right now. No matter what I give him, he always goes for the box. Always. Always goes for the box. And then over time, we start maturing and understanding that there is a gift inside the box that actually means a lot more. My parents realized that when we were growing up and eventually they stopped buying wrapping paper and just wrapped our gifts in newspaper. And it's not because we were, you know, we were ordinary or, or hicks or anything like that. It's because the wrapping didn't matter at that point. It's because what mattered was the gift that was inside. And so often we look at the wrapping that's around the blessing or the perfect way of God and we think this is it. We get disappointed. We look at the wrapping, for example, of our ministry, the way God is using us. And we may look at this, at this Walmart that at one point years ago was abandoned. And we may have thought, that's it. The wrapper doesn't look good. I am gone. Not until the wrapper changes. And God is saying, never focus on the wrapper. Focus on the gift. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. Check out what Paul says about that, mo that um, moment of maturity. It says, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Check this out. Now we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. You know what he's saying? He's saying right now we may focus on the wrapper, but there will be a moment where we will see the gift. And we can begin that moment today by seeing the gift that is Jesus Christ. What if Joseph and Mary, what if the shepherds, what if the, 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 the wise kings had focused on the strips of cloth around this child? What if they would have focused on the stable? What if they would have focused on this little town called Bethlehem? What if they would have focused on the animals around the stable or even the smell? See, those are things we focus on right now. When my son was born, I didn't want anybody to touch him. And, of course, everybody touched him with their dirty hands. Christians. They, they could have known better. I was focusing on the wrapper. And God is saying he was, he was wrapped in ordinary, but he is extraordinary. He is wrapped in low, but he is high. Not high in that way, but high, lifted up. <laughs> he is wrapped in something that doesn't look like a perfect gift, but he himself is perfection. And that is my perfect way. Check this out. What does he say in John chapter 14, verse 6? It says the words of Jesus defining that he is the perfect way of God. I am the, I am the, I am the, the truth and the life. And no one can come to the Father but through me. No one can come to the Father but through the perfect way of God. And he was wrapped in ordinary so that all of us who think of ourselves as ordinary, filled with imperfection, Wrapped in pain and inconvenience, wrapped in sin, can relate to a God who was willing to leave his throne and join us right here in the stable where everything is dirty so that he could bring his cleanliness, his purity, his perfection in our lives. And that is God's perfect way. And my, my challenge to us this morning is, are we willing to trust God in the middle of imperfection? Are we willing to trust him? And the fact that his perfect way can come through and that Jesus is the perfect way of God. Can you say that out loud? Jesus is the perfect way of God. Jesus is the, Jesus is the perfect way of God. And if you want to accept Jesus as your Lord today, if you feel like you are ordinary, but you feel like this extraordinary king came, to save your life, then, then you can join us after the service and we can pray together so that we can begin 
a life together that follows his perfect way in obedience and surrender to his will. No matter where, you at, where you're at, no matter where you come from, he came for you. So I want to ask everybody, please close your eyes. And I want you to, I want you to just see your life if it's full of inconvenience, if it's full of pain, if it's full of imperfection. I want you to see that wrapper and take it off. And I want you to see Jesus as the center of that. And let's pray together. Jesus, Son of God, thank you for becoming the perfect gift in the middle of an imperfect world. Thank you for becoming an extraordinary God and King in the middle of an ordinary life. And Jesus, we may be living in the midst of inconvenience or pain or process, but Father, we give our lives to you. Jesus, we want to follow you. We want to, we want to align ourselves with your perfect way and will and word and son so that you can get the glory in my life and the lives of my brothers and sisters around me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this moment. Thank you for your perfect way. We pray all these things and sing and worship in your beautiful and holy name, Jesus Christ, Son of God, powerful, almighty, extraordinary, perfect Son of God. Amen and amen.